Hello, welcome to this meeting of the Planning and Development Council of the Town of Oakville. This evening, uh, we have regrets from Councillor Palmer, and otherwise, we have a full house. Um, Council, are there uh, any declarations of pecuniary interest? Uh, Madam Clerk, I see none. Uh, could we uh, move into Committee of the Whole, Council? We just need two of you, Councillor Lischina and Councillor Knoll. Thank you. Any objection? Seeing none, that carries, and we are resolved into Committee of the Whole. And uh, let me ask you, Council, if you have any separations from the consent items, and if you don't have any for the three consent items, can I have a motion? Councillor Duddock, thank you for moving the consent items. Is there any objection? Madam Clerk, there's no objection. The consent items are adopted. Uh, there being no confidential consent items, we now turn to our public hearing item. This is a uh, issues identification session, and uh, we are not making a decision on this file. And if anyone who's watching would like to weigh in on this topic, uh, you, can, uh, you can call 905-815-6095, and we'll connect you to the meeting, and you'll be called upon to speak following other delegations. Uh, we have um, two delegations registered, Joe Nanos of Tridell and Adam Feynman of Del Manor. And uh, uh, we also have a presentation by Kate Coburn, our senior planner. So council, I think we should uh, give the Zoom to Ms. Coburn and uh, she can review for the public the report that you've all studied and then we'll hear from the delegations and then we'll, we'll uh, canvas everyone for questions and issues. Thank you. Ms. Coburn, away you go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, members of the council. This evening before you is an application for a zoning bylaw amendment. Um, the zoning bylaw amendment has been submitted by MHBC Planning on behalf of their client, Del Manor West Oak, Inc. And the proposal relates to seniors housing for 315 units within an eight story building and an additional 27 independent living townhouse units for a total of 342 units. The report can be found as item 6.1 of tonight's agenda. And the purpose of tonight's meeting as stated is to introduce the application to council and the public and to obtain any further comments for review as relates to this application. As said earlier as well, if there is anyone watching a live stream of this meeting on oakville.ca and they wish to speak to the item, they can contact 905-815-6095 to be connected to the meeting and they'll be called upon following the registered delegations. Just of note, the applicant did hold a public information meeting on April 29th, 2021. There were 10 people uh, in attendance of that meeting and we have since received nine letters of objection to date uh, up into including today's meeting. Slide please. The property is known as the St. Flodomir's Cultural Center at 1280 Dundas Street West. It is located on the south side of Dundas Street and it abuts the southerly extension of Fourth Line. The application relates to a portion of the lands which are located at the northeast corner of the site, highlighted in red on your page, and this abuts Fourth Line. Should the application be approved at a future meeting, it is the applicant's intent to divide the lands to create a standalone parcel uh, for the proposed seniors housing. Slide. Just to add to this slide, the lands contain, uh, do contain and are adjacent to various natural heritage features, which includes a 16 mile creek to the east. This image represents an approximate location of the natural heritage feature as it relates to the property and any land division that should occur on the property would require the conveyance of all of these natural heritage features as well as buffer areas to the town. This would create a natural division of the cultural center lands uh, to the north from the cemetery lands that currently exist to the south. The staff will continue to review the application and consider the impacts that this may have and report back at a future meeting. Next slide. To further build upon this slide, there is currently a gap that exists approximately 275 meters between the two cul-de-sac ends of fourth line, one extending uh, southerly from Dundas and the one that would continue on your page as you see. Uh, these are currently connected by a trail 
and it is expected to remain in its current condition as it's shown in yellow on the slide. There are no intentions of connecting fourth line through this section as part of this proposal. Slide please. Building further, the lands uh, are within a vicinity of the AM radio tower that is located on the north side of Dundas Street West. Slide. And further, the, the property is also in proximity or adjacent to a built heritage resource that is located at 2477 Fourth Line, which is known as the old schoolhouse. Now that we have our bearings, slide please. The slide, the proposal has been oriented um, to provide the most maximum view of the property council. Um, so the indication of where the north arrow is, Dundas Street resides on the most leftern portion of your property, of the slide that you're seeing. The proposal relates to the redevelopment of a portion of the lands for seniors housing, with access being proposed from Fourth Line, which currently ends in the cul-de-sac south of Dundas Street West. The applicant proposes to construct an eight story building, which would contain 315 units. These units are comprised of 34 assisted living units, 34 memory care based units, 116 independent supportive living units, and 131 independent living units. And this would occur on the east side or the topmost portion of the screen. The applicant also proposes 27 independent living townhouse units which would be on the west side of the site or at the bottom part of your screen, over four blocks. There is a total of 226 parking spaces, which are also proposed, which would include resident and visitor parking spaces that would be provided both in a surface parking area that is centralized to the site, as well as dedicated private garages for the townhouse units. The property was once listed on the Heritage Register for a former barn structure that was located in this vicinity, which had relations to the Triller Howell family. Any redevelopment on this site would require a commemorative plaque to be installed through a future site plan application. Slide please. The lands are designated as private open space and natural heritage system. The portion of the lands when this application are predominantly within the private open space area, which is shown in black on the slide. The lands are also subject to a special exception. This is the entirety of the lands, which do permit the place of worship, a youth hostel, community center, senior citizens housing, conservation uses, and active and passive recreational uses. As the special exception permits seniors housing, an official plan amendment is not required for this proposal. Slide, please. With respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment, the existing zoning on the private uh, property is private open space 02, special provision 122, natural area, and cemetery. And this would encompass all of the uses that are currently on the site. The proposed application for the rezoning is in line with the official plan policies with respect to the land use um, only where the official plan recognizes seniors housing as a permitted use. The applicant proposes to rezone this northeast portion of the site to permit the seniors use, seniors housing use, which is currently a not listed permission. And it would be in the form of the eight story building and 27 townhouse use, townhouse units. The application proposes to maintain the existing private open space zone but provide further modifications to facilitate the proposal, which would include by adding the seniors housing use. The private open space zone provides only very few regulations specifically related to setback heights and lot coverage for the range of uses permitted within the O2 zone. The special provision would provide for any additional range of uses and would does not further modify the O2 zone. So there are no additional modifications for setbacks or building height within the special modification. The applicant's proposed zoning would align with the intended uses as stated, as well as heights, setbacks as provided within Appendix A of the staff report in the applicant's draft zoning bylaw amendment. 
Staff will also note the applicant is requesting a council endorsement through their rezoning application to permit any future minor variance applications within two years of the application should it be approved. And staff will continue to evaluate the merits of this request further and report back at a future meeting. The table that's shown on this slide demonstrates the few regulations that would be altered by the application and what, should, what is currently permitted as of right. Slide, please. In the next two slides, we'll reflect on the various matters identified by staff to date and are captured within the staff report. This will include consistency with provincial policy statement and the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, conformity with the region official plan, the evaluation of natural areas and all natural heritage features that are impacts to the subject site and this proposal, as well as considering the proposed development to the satisfaction of the region and conservation halted, which could include the conveyance of natural features through a future land division application. Evaluation of potential impacts from CHWO radio station tower on the proposed development. Conformity with urban design policies on matters such as bill form, building heights, transition, and compatibility with adjacent properties, and the interface with public realms and vehicular access. With respect to the potential impacts from the AM radio tower, the applicant has submitted a radio impact study, which has been peer reviewed. Staff continue to review and evaluate the application and the contents of that peer review with the applicant. Slide, please. Additional matters would in, uh, include adequacy of the site to be serviced by existing municipal infrastructure, impacts of the proposed development with respect to the heritage resource of the old schoolhouse, comprehensive re consideration of comprehensive redevelopment of the remaining land holdings and the potential requirement for any future plans of subdivision which may include the extension of Glen Eyre Gate, the western portion of the property. Also to be considered are any future improvements of fourth line that may impact the proposal, impacts um, of the proposal on the existing trail network, and to ensure that the proposed zoning bylaw appropriately implements the vision of the Louisville official plan. With these matters to be addressed and all comments together uh, received at tonight's meeting, uh, they will be addressed at a future report to be presented to council. That can, uh, for recommendations put before council this evening um, include the following as shown on the slide. Slide please. And this concludes my presentation. And if there are any delegations watching again, they can contact the number shown on the screen. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Coburn. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you call the uh, delegations and then we'll do questions? First delegations are Joe Nanos from Tridel and Adam Feynman from Del Manor. Welcome, sirs. Council looks forward to your information. Hi, uh, good evening, uh, good members evening. of uh, Oldsville Council. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Um, I'm pleased to be here tonight. My name is Joe Nanos. I'm the Director of Development for Dell Manor. I want to thank Kate, uh, the Senior Planner, for doing the presentation. I'll try to go over our presentation quickly and not repeat uh, what uh, she went over. Um, first of all, um, as you know, we already have a presence in Oakville and we're really pleased and excited to be coming back to Oakville with our second uh, Dell Manor facility, uh, in addition to our existing facility at Glen Abbey. Uh, we're introducing tonight our new project for Oakville Seniors Retirement Community called West Oak Dell Manor. Um, also tonight, um, with me tonight uh, to also speak about Dell Manor is the president and COO of Dell Manor, uh, Mr. Adam Feynman. Uh, to answer any questions, we also have Oz Kamel from MHBC Planning uh, as well, as well as our traffic and env environmental engineers if there's any questions. Also observing the meeting tonight and available for any questions are representatives from St. Vladimir's, uh, Bodan Winicky, who is the, their planning consultant, as well as uh, Vince Adamek, who is on the St. Volos board. Next slide. So I'm going to turn it over to um, 
Adam Feynman, the president of Dell Manor, who's going to introduce a little bit about uh, background about Dell Manor. Uh, next slide. Adam, if you can unmute Adam. Am I still on mute or am I okay? Uh, we can hear you. Perfect. Good evening, everyone. Thank you again for, for allowing us to come in this evening. I just want to take a moment of your time and speak to you high level about uh, Dell Manor and what it is that we do. So as you can see on this slide here, this is our current mission statement. And we are retirement communities chosen by people who love to live life and expect the best. Uh, Joe, next slide, please. So Del Manor currently owns and operates five retirement communities across the GTA with another soon to open in Aurora. We have over 600 residents who live with us, along with employing 330 people. Our operating model spans the continuum of care from independent living through to supportive and assisted living through to memory care. Our premium service model includes elegant dining experiences for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, a robust wellness and care program, and our engaging <clears throat> excuse me, activity program, all within well-appointed suites in our buildings that are as aesthetically pleasing as they are well-located. Joe, next slide, please. And right here is a quick summary of where all of our current properties are located around the GTA. Okay, next slide. You've already heard about the subject lands and uh, the stranded land uses. Um, I just wanted to highlight that um, the subject lands that uh, on which the Dell Manor project is proposed uh, is approximately um, just over 11 acres um, and part of a larger land holdings of St. Vladimir's. Um, with regards to um, uh, surrounding uses, you've heard also that there is a ra um, AM radio stations on the north side of uh, Dundas Avenue. Uh, we've heard um, some input we had at the community meeting as well. Uh, we've had some correspondence received from White Oaks, the owners of the AIM radio stations, and we're now in dialogue with them in, a, in an effort to address their concerns. We'll be continuing dialogue with them uh, as we go through this process. Uh, next slide, please. This just summarizes the main statistics for the project. One thing I just wanted to highlight because you've heard most of uh, this uh, description before by Kate, but in terms of the density, when you look at the parcel that we're dealing with, which is the 11 acre parcel, um, the overall density comes out to of an FSI of just under one times at 0 0.86 times. And that's given the large, the large size of the, of the property. Also just wanted to note that in terms of um, uh, car parking, we're proposing a total of 226 parking spaces and the bylaw requires approximately 170. Next slide, please. This is a, 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 our concept site plan. We will be submitting at a future date a, a site plan application, which will get into more detail in, in terms of the design elements and uh, building materials and specific um, landscaping elements. But this gives you an idea of where the green space is throughout the property and how the site is organized. One thing I just wanted to highlight, which was mentioned earlier, is that we're only proposing one uh, vehicular access off of uh, fourth line, the segment that is runs parallel to uh, Dundas Street. Um, that will lead to an internal courtyard with uh, surface parking as well as a drop off area. We are not proposing any access points off, off of the south leg of fourth line that leads to the cul-de-sac. Um, in terms of site organization, we've, uh, take, uh, we've made efforts to try to minimize the footprint of the building um, so we can retain as much of the natural feature and open space as possible on the property. Overall, um, on this particular site of the 11 acres, just from what you see here, the natural feature to the south um, uh, and that finger that sort of uh, projects into the uh, parking lot area, which is the, the ravine area and the tributary of the 60 mile creek is proposed to be retained uh, as well as uh, buffer areas around those natural features as well. So overall, uh, just on this 11 acres here, um, about 21% of the site area would be protected in, in, into green space and, and um, dedicated to, um, to the city. Um, overall, the building has a, um, uh, 
a coverage of about 18% uh, on, on, on this 11 acre parcel as well. Uh, lastly, we, um, we, we're gonna introduce a number of green features on the site, Dell Manor buildings, um, have uh, high quality architecture and green features, including uh, green roofs, uh, bird friendly windows, bird friendly and animal friendly uh, landscapes as well. So we're gonna work with the city to try to get as many green features as possible on the property. Next slide. This is a, a Massey model that shows the eight story main building looking southwest uh, from 16 Mile Creek and Dundas, just to give you a sense of um, the massing of the building. And as I said earlier, detailed design will be undertaken through the site plan uh, process. Next slide. This slide is looking northeast towards Dundas, and you can see the building uh, overlooking the 16 Mile Creek, which we feel is a great location for seniors uh, to be, uh, um, be, have able, be able to access the uh, many trail systems in this area. Next slide. So some of the um, uh, some of the uh, benefits of the project that we we feel this project is presenting is a continuum of care for Oakville's elderly population, um, help to meet the demand uh, of of uh, seniors housing in the area, uh, high quality architectural design, extensive lag landscaping throughout the site, uh, protection and enhancement of environmental features on the site, as well as providing uh, significant uh, opportunities for employment on site as well. Next slide. So this just uh, gives an overview of where we are in the planning process. We, as you've heard earlier, we had our statutory meeting on April 29th, or committee meeting on April 29th. And we heard from residents at that meeting, uh, as well as we've received, since received some letters. Um, after tonight's meeting, we will then take all the comments that we hear uh, from here uh, tonight at council, as well as from the residents uh, at the committee meeting and from the city planning department and the agencies. And then we will have further consultation with the local councillors and city staff and the community, and then submit a second submission uh, in uh, later this year. Next, uh, next slide. And that concludes the presentation. Uh, please answer any questions. Thank you very much for your information. Uh, as it happens, we have several questioners for you. And uh, somebody in your party may have a mic open and some activity going on that you're sharing with the public. So uh, if you didn't mean to do that, you might want to look to that. Uh, we have questions from Councillor Adams, Councillor Longo, Councillor Elgar, Councillor Robertson, and Councillor Knoll, and who knows what will develop after that. So uh, Councillor Adams. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the, both the staff presentation as well as the applicant's presentation. Uh, the question I wanted to ask you about was, uh, was there any consideration given to either structured parking or underground parking instead of surface parking? Through you, Mr. Chairman, we looked at that option as well, but one of the um, attributes of this site is it's a large site that we can both have uh, a significant amount of landscaping as well as siting the building and parking, surface parking. And that's one of the key factors that make this uh, project feasible for us in terms of having the surface parking. So it's purely a financial decision? Well, th that's one, one aspect, but not the only aspect. What we felt with, as I said earlier, is that given that it's an 11 acre site and the building is only covering 18% of the site, as I said earlier, out of the four hectares of, of the site, which is 11 acres, we're proposing to dedicate one, um, one hectare uh, of the natural feature. And that doesn't include the green spaces on the site that's to be retained. So we felt that overall, when you look at the landscaped areas, the areas that are gonna be conveyed, uh, the building footprint and the parking, uh, that the surface parking uh, didn't um, uh, overwhelm the overall site because of, because of the large uh, nature of the site. Thank you. Uh, Your Worship, I'd like to ask our staff about that question as well when the time is appropriate. Now is as good a time as any. You're, you have the floor. Uh, great. Um, I wonder if our staff could comment on the uh, issue of surface parking versus structured or uh, underground parking for uh, long-term uh, seniors' residences of this type. 
uh, in, in also including uh, high density uh, kind of applications. And so, they're, they're as I understand it, Councillor, we're here to identify issues for staff to report back on. This is one of the issues you'd like added to the list? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have anything else? No. All right. Councillor Longo, you're next. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Uh, this is uh, the uh, Kate. I had uh, um, participated in the April 29th meeting uh, with Del Manor. And they had captured some of my questions and I didn't see them on your issues list. So uh, I can repeat them here if that's possible, but uh, I, I know you have copies of the minutes, but related uh, to climate change, a question um, on uh, tree canopy, what uh, trees were gonna be protected, but then also which trees could be added to the site. Uh, so that was one area. Another area was related to building materials and what they were going to do from an energy efficiency perspective building materials as well as um, you know any appliances and things like that so uh, I think they they noted that um, and then there was a question I guess we had some um, comments from from those surrounding related to the building height uh, and the eight stories so those are pretty much if, if you look at the minutes from the public meeting those were my questions that I and issues that I'd like to be addressed if possible Thank you, Councillor. I, I wrote down your four pretty easily, so I'm pretty sure uh, Acting Director Charles has done so too. Thank you very much. Thank Next, you. we have Councillor Elger. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Burton, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, a few questions, uh, just to roll back a little bit. A number of years ago when they rebuilt the, the Dundas Street Bridge, there was a major catastrophe with regard to a large piece of equipment due to radio frequency It burned out all of the electronics. And my concern is that we are building a senior's residence. And in the reports back then, they said the RF frequency could have an impact on pacemakers, et cetera. That kind of kind of scared me a little bit. And I, I know I'd addressed it at the previous meeting with uh, Bill Manor. I'm just wondering, so Mr. Feynman, I understand that the uh, White Oaks group uh, wanted to come on uh, site to do signal strength readings, uh, but after a point in time, uh, I think it was, uh, I think that at, uh, the, the uh, Del Manor said, in fact, that they would do them. Now, I have, to date, I don't believe the White House Communications Group have received any information on the readings. Is that correct? That's correct. The readings were recently done. The report is currently being put together and it hasn't been submitted to us yet. Okay. So you will be giving that to the White X Communications Group, all the information? My, my understanding is that we will be sharing it in a collaborative way. Okay. That, that, that's, a, that's great because I think that's what they really need because they want to make sure that uh, they don't have any negative impact on the building as I'm sure you wouldn't want that either. Um, there's also with, uh, apparently in the, uh, the RF impact study that you did by YRH, it said there would be an impact on the radio stations, could be an impact on the radio station signal strength. Is that correct? And if that is correct, would, what would be done so that they would not be negatively impacted by Sorry. Del Manor? Sure. So Oh, sorry. I was just going to, I think part of the benefit here is that we did reach out uh, in advance and we've already started to build that relationship. And the reality is, um, from our understanding, is the earlier in the process that we can involve White Oaks, uh, the mitigation can begin. Uh, we really need, there may be an impact, there may not be an impact, but if there is, it will be identified early on and, and remediation will be put into place for us. Uh, well, yeah, I really appreciate that because I don't think there was a lot of, mediation between the development to the west of the White Oaks Towers with regard to the Graydon Banning Agreement uh, for the housing going in there. And I believe it was all settled before it went to the uh, the LPAT. So that, that would be really good if you get that all settled so we don't have to ever think about a person looking out the window, get sapped, his face maker doesn't work very no. good. So. And, and one of the things we spoke about too, Councillor, is that from at least our perspective, we do realize the sensitivity and the nature of the residents that we're bringing to the building. And, and we wouldn't do it if it wasn't safe. Well, that, that, that's, that's actually what I really wanted to hear from you. 
and also that White Oaks agrees with that because I think they, I, from what I've, I've been told, they really do want to work to make it work for everybody, and that in fact that they are not impact, impacted negatively. So I Absolutely. thank you very much for that. Thank you. For sure. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Elgar. Councillor Robertson, you're next. Hi, uh, this is about the site plan and also about the um, actual building itself and its uses. I am on the Seniors Working Advisory Group for Oakville, um, and I also watched the four hour seniors webinar by Canada 2020 last year with the minister, last week, sorry, with the Minister of Seniors on it. And my question right now is, is there any consideration to it becoming more than just a seniors area? Uh, one of the biggest things that came out of that webinar was the fact that we tend to keep seniors in isolated pockets like this without interaction with the greater community. And um, the advantages of having people mixed in the building to uh, to give a different perspective. This has Del Manor considered this at all? So oh, great question. I think a lot of it speaks to the way in which we'll roll out our programming at the property. Um, part of what we do, and and we've done it in, at our other property in Oakville, is we do integrate as best we can in the community at large. Uh, we're not trying to simply build a siloed community here. And you hear me coming back and using the word community because to the truest sense, the success of our business is very reliant on our ability to, to integrate. Now, part of our programming involves uh, taking residents off site. We have transportation vehicles that we use as part of uh, the services that we offer. Uh, in cases where our residents aren't mobile and they can't leave, we do host a lot of programming within the building. So we do a lot of work with, in some cases, schools, we bring in students, we do a lot of work with local craftspeople who bring in their wares for sale. Uh, we have events at the property when it's not COVID times uh, to really engage our residents. So as much as some of the focus would be on what's going on outside, a lot of the focus from our perspective of what goes on in the inside. Do you foresee changes if as we come out of this pandemic, the focus becomes more being able to stay in home with care versus moving into a place like Del Manor? You know what, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think it really depends on the funding models that the government comes forward with and the services that they do make available. Uh, one of the things that allows us to, to run a successful business is not only delivering care within it, within a structured environment, but also that socialization component. And while a senior can stay at home and receive services behind the door, uh, they're really, in some cases, missing out significantly uh, on that socialization piece, which is something that we do bring to the table. Thank you very much. That was great. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Robertson. Uh, Councillor Knoll. Thank you. Uh, my, per, uh, my main question was with respect to uh, parking that Councillor Adams covered, but um, I, I, I have one additional, sorry, two additional, um, and that is with respect to uh, the issue of visibility uh, from the, six, the Lions Valley Park. Is it possible to, uh, when this comes back, to get a 3D model of what uh, this might uh, look like from the 60 Mile Valley? Um, you know, as our community becomes more and more urbanized, the sanctity of uh, places like 16 Mile Creek uh, are critical for our uh, quality of life and our well-being. And I would like to uh, see what the impacts will be, the visual impacts will be uh, from um, uh, the, the actual valley system. Is that a part getting a 3D? I've seen 3D models uh, submitted with applications before we had one uh, for a development in Ward 5 at uh, uh, Leland, I, I would love to see one for this one as well. Second, if, um, through you, Mr. Chair, we, we could we could take some uh, uh, vantage points from the from the valley and and see how the building looks from from uh, from the vantage point of the valley. We certainly can do that as part of uh, our resubmission. Thank you. I would appreciate that. My second uh, uh, question: I saw a lot of folks um, that were commenting from the various public meetings asked this as well. I could not find 
uh, succinct answer. Will there be any impacts to access uh, to the trail uh, from fourth line? I know right now it's a, it's an alternate, not uh, sorry to the valley. I know it's an alternate uh, access to uh, 16 mile, 16 mile Creek Valley there, the Lions uh, Valley. I'm just curious if, uh, if uh, access will be maintained. My understanding is that access is on the city right of way. So our project is not impacting that access. So okay. I believe that should be a question for city staff. That's great. And perhaps I could redirect the staff at the appropriate time then. They're taking notes now, Councillor. Uh, your, your, your concern, your question has been noted. Thank you, Your Worship. All right, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Chisholm, please. Thank you, Worship. My question, um, I guess it might be more of a site plan question, but uh, however, is the uh, access in, uh, into the, uh, the new, this large complex off of Dundas, and knowing Dundas is a very busy highway, <laughs> um, is this going to be a signalized, a signalized um, location, left-hand turning lanes? How are we dealing with the, the traffic flow coming in and out of the, uh, this um, project? Through you, Mr. Chair. We're, as I said earlier, we're posing one access point um, onto fourth line on the east-west segment. It is well spaced uh, from the existing access point to St. Vladimir's driveway. Uh, I believe it's about 35 uh, meters in, in distance separation. Um, aside from um, occasional uh, um, hikers that park on, on fourth line uh, to, to access the trail systems, um, there's no other vehicles uh, entering at, at that segment of uh, fourth line. So our traffic consultant has looked at um, uh, the level of traffic anticipated and, and doesn't feel that there would be a need for a signal. Obviously, there's a signalization existing already at Dundas and fourth line. So what will happen is uh, residents and visitors will come out on, from, from the driveway onto fourth line, uh, make a left turn, uh, then, then go to the intersection of Dundas and Fourth Line, which is signalized. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chisholm. Councillor Hazlitt Deal. Thank you, Mayor Burton. Um, my question is around um, the design and how you may have factored in or adjusted your design uh, based on uh, our experience through the pandemic. As as you'll be well aware, our long-term care residents and their families have gone through an incredible amount of isolation and, um, and a catastrophe. Um, and I'm wondering what you did in terms of learning from our experience uh, in the design of this building. I'm gonna refer that question to Adam. Oh, great question. <laughs> by the way, and one of the things that makes Delmarna unique was that a lot of the building, the way in which the building is configured is really that the programming drives the configuration. We do have a lot of amenity space in the building. If we were working on a tighter plate or we had fewer amenity spaces, then there would be more credence to the question that you've asked because we would be making significant changes in terms of how things are spaced out in the building. But the, because of the way in which this building was already designed, there's minor modifications to take into account for pandemic planning in the future. We do have adequately spaced uh, suites. We've got the wide corridors. We've got places within the building where we could uh, cohort people. Now, one of the things, and I'll share this with you from, from a infection management perspective, we cohorted within the building. So essentially what we did was we locked people Sorry, that's not the right choice of words. We basically locked down each floor, assigned staff to the specific floors, and managed each floor independent of each other in order to contain the virus. I don't think notionally we'd be designing our buildings any differently in order to, to manage that in the future, aside from putting staff break rooms more interspersed more frequently throughout the building. But really, when this occurred, that was that was how we changed our operating model to account. Uh, really to contain to contain a spread. And if an infection did in fact happen, the contact tracing was much easier for us to do. So thank you for that. Um, one of the, the um, 
primary um, mental health issues for um, uh, seniors that were in isolation is that inability to um, meet with family. Is there anything in the design that would um, anticipate an, uh, an ability to have uh, a greater connection with family, albeit, you know, from either a distance or um, uh, cordoned off in a way that would allow them to still um, see the face of those they love um, and have some confidence that they're okay. Absolutely. But I think the question or the answer, excuse me, lies more in technology than it did with the layout of the building. Uh, we relied heavily on apps like FaceTime, uh, Zoom. We have within our buildings a, um, a TV system that's closed circuited. So we were able to communicate with our residents through a dedicated channel and we were able to facilitate exercise class. So our our lifestyles manager would be filmed. It would be piped through the building so that we can engage residents on a daily basis. Um, we have computer stations that are open to the public. We did make iPads available to residents that didn't have. The buildings, luckily, are equipped with Wi-Fi. So we really promoted as much technology to facilitate that interaction as what we could. Um, even with the guidelines now lifting, we're still pretty restricted in what we can and can't do. We are allowed to have up to five visitors outside today by reservation. Moving forward, I, I don't know if we'd be able to change how much outdoor space we could commit to this. And then winter, of course, of course poses a challenge of, of going outside. Um, so I would say that the, the easiest way for us to, to manage that in the future is probably to rely more on technology than it would be to, to configure the building for, for design. For you, Mr. Chair, I, I just want to add to what Adam said is that Adam's comments pertain to, to the building itself, but when you look at the site plan design, and I know this is a preliminary landscape design that we're presenting, but as I said earlier, there's ample landscape space on site. And if you look closely at the landscape concept that we prepared, there's three major outdoor amenity areas that uh, the seniors can congregate at, as well as visitors. So in terms of spacing out on the property, provided people are allowed to uh, meet uh, residents outdoor, there's more than ample space uh, on the site being set aside for outdoor amenity area. And this is in addition to the natural heritage features that are gonna be preserved and, and blocked off with buffers. So this is amenity area that's gonna be programmed with, with benches and landscaping and trees. And you can see through the, the plan clearly that there's three very large areas that, that are gonna be utilized by residents uh, for, for, for seating, for walking around, for meeting their, their relatives. I just wanted to add that, thank you. Well, thank you for adding that. And, uh, and thank you for that clarification. I just have one final question and that is just on heat and air exchange and all of that. Um, I mean, there's a building code standard and then there is um, a higher standard that, um, you know, for ex other public facilities have had to quickly uh, adapt to. Um, any, uh, in terms of going above the building code, in terms of air exchange, et cetera, is that part of your plan? We, we haven't got into the details uh, of the building systems at this point. Uh, but that's certainly something that we can look at uh, during the site plan process. Anything that improves uh, the air quality uh, uh, and safety of our residents is something that we're, we're definitely supportive. Um, you know, Del Manor is, is, is the builder of, of, of the facility, but we're also the operator and, and we're, we're going to be there uh, for a very long time. So it's in our interest to have the best uh, building systems, the most efficient, the most uh, healthy. Uh, for our residents. So that's certainly something that we can look at to, to go um, beyond the building code requirements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Um, all right, uh, Madam Clerk, are there any other delegations? We do have a phone-in delegation, Andrew Ion. Hello, Mr. Ion. Um, you have the Zoom. Welcome. Council looks forward to your information. Do you have issues you'd like listed in the staff evaluation of this application? Good 
evening, everybody. Can you hear me now? Hello? Hello. Hi, thank you. Sorry, problems with Zoom. Um, just speaking on behalf of several residents of Falkland Crescent, as we've previously heard from counselors, there are concerns raised about the height of this proposal. That said, I'd just like to share another angle for consideration. The fact that the nearby Del Manor Glen Abbey at Upper Middle and Notting Hill is only two stories, and the Rivera on the third line is why does this one need to be eight? And instead of one very big building flanked by small townhouses, why not have several smaller buildings? Would that not allow it to be possible to reach achieve the same overall density, as well as not interfere with the radio. Thank you for that. Uh, as I understand it, uh, staff are have already been asked by council to add consideration of the height as one of the issues to be evaluated. Uh, does that cover your, your concern? The height, but also relative size to similar structures in the neighborhood. Right. Okay. I think I think they've I think they understand it that way. Can we help you any other way? That is it. Well, thank you very much for bringing your information and uh, adding to the report. Uh, the the staff will have a little extra to do. Thanks to you. Um, all right. I'm gonna. Any others, Madam Clerk? Okay, we'll confine it to table and uh, we'll look for, I think it's time to look to the director to um, rhyme off what he caught and for council to uh, uh, make sure that everything they wanted on there is on there. Mr. Charles, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The other issues that we would add to the list uh, beyond those which are already in the staff report were, was to include uh, an investigation of uh, possible parking options such as utilizing a structure what trees will be protect, protected and what other trees can be added, what building materials and appliances will be used to address energy efficiency, We're also asked to investigate the overall building height, and to also include a model of the proposal as viewed from the valley. So uh, just to be sure that we capture the, the delegation from the resident, in your consideration of height, are you gonna consider alternatives to height, such as, you know, more more coverage of the land and smaller and shorter buildings? Correct. Thank we'll you. look at a few staff, thank you. All right, is there, um, um, uh, um, Councillor Elgar, are you moving the report? Or hey, adding Mayor, I'll be pleased to move the report. Just a question regarding radio frequency. I didn't hear anything in, the, in there about radio frequency issues possible. It's already in the report. It's an issue identified in the report and in the slides that we saw. That is, it, it, and it will continue, correct. Okay, yeah, thank correct. you. I would be pleased to, I'll move this receipt of the information. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any objection? Madam Clerk, there's no objection. The matter is carried and we will move on to 6.2. Thank you to our delegations. Thank you. 6.2 is the public meeting and recommendation report for the town initiated official plan amendment 35 and this concerns the hospital district. We have a presentation from Kirk Bigger, our senior planner. And uh, we have a registered delegation. After that, we'll have questions, comments, and a decision. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Burton and members of council, good evening. This is the recommendation meeting for the hospital district, official plan amendment number 35, and it's listed as item 6.2 in the addendum agenda. This is also the second public meeting we have held for the hospital district. And one of the reasons for this second public meeting is that we have improved our level of notification to include properties within 120 meters of the study area. So that's a bit broader notification that we use this for this second public meeting. Next slide, please. This is for those watching the live stream of this meeting. If you wish to speak to this item, please call us at 905-815-6095 and we will connect you to the meeting. You'll be called on to speak following the registered delegations. Next slide, please. 
So just a bit of uh, a bit of context and a reminder about how we got here. The uh, the townwide official plan, Louisville Oakville identifies an urban structure, and through OPA 15, we recognized a number of nodes and corridors across town for areas to accommodate uh, future growth and, and intensification. And so in in the OPA, as you'll see our OPA 15 schedule here, you'll see the star identifying the hospital district study area lands. And the direction there uh, under nodes and corridors for further study was to uh, establish a more detailed area specific plan for the study area. Next slide, please. Currently, the North Oakville West secondary plan identifies the hospital district lands identified in red on the slide as the health oriented mixed use node. And so those policies really spoke to additional study and a unique capacity around the hospital to accommodate uh, some special some special level of development and intensification. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is just an air photo that you would be all familiar with at this point in time. The hospital district is located at the intersection of, of uh, Bronte, or sorry, Dundas Street West and Third Line, uh, centered around the hospital and uh, the Greenlands Air Note Kids to the north and um, all seniors care developing as well along Dundas to the west of the hospital and uh, some some to be occupied greenfield areas. It's approximately 75 hectares in total. Next slide, please. So we've had a we've had a great study timeline here. This gets back to uh, as I mentioned the North Oak the West Secondary Plan, which was adopted by Council in 2009, identified the health oriented mixed use node, uh, the urban structure, OPA 15 in 2017. The initiation of the hospital district study in 2018 with our Livable Oakville Council subcommittee. We hired a consultant in 2019 to undertake this work, a consultant with a number of subconsultants, and the, the prime consultant there was Sajeki Planning Limited. Their task was to develop an area specific plan for the hospital district. We held a, pol a public workshop in the fall of 2019, and we brought forward a draft official plan amendment in November 2020 to a statutory public meeting. At that meeting, we received some great input from the stakeholders as well as from council and a a further workshop was requested by council and, and uh, next next slide please we'll get into that the purpose of the workshop really was uh, intended to provide some additional understanding and to facilitate a discussion to seek further input into the ongoing study the workshop was facilitated by the hospital district study consultants and um, we had a really good session. In fact, we held that in conjunction with uh, a workshop on Palermo Village and the, and the um, Northwest area of Oakville. So some of the key messages that we received and the input we received at that workshop included a re-examination of, of a concept that was in the draft official plan amendment around development precincts. Uh, there was a, um, a question about the value of those precincts and as well some very specific employment thresholds that were different for each of the precincts and, and attached to those precincts alone. Uh, there was some, some great feedback about maintaining an employment focus and that residential would be complementary to the employment focus of the hospital district and we heard a range of views on building heights, uh, some about total heights and some about a focus for heights. We also, uh, so following that that workshop we had a number of comments received from the participating landowners and a series of follow-up meetings and discussions were held with those groups to further understand what their concerns were and so we had some good discussions around that and were able to resolve matters through policy development we were able staff were able to clarify the policies that had been put forward just so there was a common understanding and there was some general support expressed for the directions that the study had taken in the draft official plan amendment However, all of this great feedback did prompt some revisions, which is why we're back again for public meeting. Some of those revisions are, are a little bit different from before, and so it's important to give people notice and an opportunity to speak to those. Next slide, please. The area specific plan by Sajeki was revised as a result of the input received in the February workshop, that's February uh, 2020, 2021, sorry. Um, the precincts were removed and the employment thresholds were removed from the individual precincts. There was a revised discussion in the area specific plan about the character of the area. We updated the employment threshold requirements 
there were some uh, increased height permissions allowed to reflect existing permissions, uh, existing planning approvals for lands south of William Halton and to the east of Third Line. There was additional discussion around parking, and I'll have another slide on that later, and design direction for the design of parking structures. And then we updated the overall target for the district to reflect, again, an employment focus of 60% jobs and 40% residents. There was some corresponding updates to some of the technical reports that resulted from the input and the changes to the air specific plan. So now I'd like to move, next slide please, I'd like to move to, into the official plan amendment, which is our focus for tonight. Essentially what we're bringing forward this evening for council's consideration is a, is a defined boundary for the hospital district, which hasn't changed through this process. This, will, this amendment, this bylaw will move the hospital district into, uh, from the 1984 official plan and into the livable Oakville plan. It'll create a new policy section 26 called the hospital district growth area and it'll create a new land use schedule, Schedule R for the hospital district. And then it will provide some um, updates and amendments to other parts of the plan just to, to fit it in and to, to weave it in properly to the Livable Oakville plan. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm just gonna get into some of the, over the next few slides, some of the highlights of the policies that are being recommended through OPA 35 this evening. The goal uh, for the, new growth area, the hospital district growth area, is for the district to be an employment focused, compact, mixed use, transit supportive urban community that provides for institutional, office, retail, and service commercial uses in combination with high density residential uses in a predominantly mid-rise built form. As with our other growth areas in Livable Oakville, we provide a, a series of policies that all fit together that have objectives objectives for the growth area, a development concept, some functional policies around transportation, urban design, for example, uh, land use, specific land use policies that deal with heights and that's those matters, um, the mix of uses. And then we have some exceptions and some, some guidance around implementation. So that's a fairly standard structure in Livable Oakville. Next slide, please. So this is the new land use schedule R for the hospital district and it identifies the, the, the core block in the center uh, the, of the hospital, the Oakville Trafalgar uh, Memorial Hospital and the Aaron Oak Kids site to just slightly to the north of William Halton Parkway. It identifies these lands as in the institutional designation. And then the balance of the lands around the hospital in the remaining blocks are identified as urban core. The urban core land use designation is a mixed use designation that permits a range of uses including residential, uh, but also office and commercial. The institutional land use designation permits a range of institutional focused uses, as well as residential accommodation that can be associated with those uses. So some examples of those would be, uh, it could be a school, it could be a hospital, for example, uh, a school like with a dormitory, like Sheridan College, for example. Uh, the schedule also identifies conceptual stormwater management facility locations, and they're in I can't really point to them, but they, they're the little round circles that appear throughout the district, as well as proposed public roads. Next slide, please. So as development occurs within the hospital district, we're trying to tie the notion of comprehensive planning and design of a block, block planning, to this concept of a development block. Uh, it's a, it's a way that we've able to tie the policies down to a specific geographic location. Um, it's it's uh, helps us. It will help us to maintain an employment focus while achieving a mix of uses. Um, the overall objective for the hospital district is to achieve a target proportion of 60% jobs and 40% residents to support this employment focus. So these six blocks will help us do that. Um, and while the boundaries of the development blocks align with the former precinct, precinct boundaries from the November draft OPA, the corresponding policies in this official plan amendment are more flexible and equitable across the district. So all the blocks outside of the hospital are treated equally in terms of their jobs to residents proportion. This, the recommended policies also recognize that there's an existing employment benefit provided 
by the existing jobs at the Oakville Trafalgar Memorial Hospital in the central block. So once we took that benefit of 100% employment and distributed it to the remaining blocks, we were able to slightly lower the proportion so that individually the minimum employment target by block would be 55% jobs, which the flip side of that is 45% uh, residents. We think that this is a, a, a good approach uh, distributing this benefit and it still retains the principle of a predominantly employment character. It maintains that, that principle, but flexibility is allowed for the new forms of employment going forward, including a work from home economy. Next slide, please. Regarding heights, uh, the, the study essentially determined that a 12 story height, maximum height was appropriate for the study area, uh, given its, its location and its envisioned function uh, and the employment focus for a mixed use node. The OPA proposes a minimum height of six stories, which is typical of our, of our mixed use designations. We have a minimum height and a maximum height. So the minimum here is six and the maximum is 12 across the district. However, there are two exceptions noted in the, in the amendment uh, and the policies. One is to permit a four-story height limit at the All Seniors Care Building, which is in block one, just to the west of the hospital block, and also a 15-story permission for the lands, it was mentioned earlier, for the lands just south of William Halton Parkway, east of Third Line. And that's a 15-story permission, and that reflects existing zoning and that's in place for those lands. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the, the big focus around is a, is a campus of care, and we've already seen all seniors care being developed. And in August of 2020, the province issued a minister zoning order uh, in support of long-term care facilities on the, in, within the hospital district. And you'll see here on the slide, the hatched area, there's a black and a yellow hatched area. That, those are the lands to which the minister zoning order applies. However, the it's anticipated that the development, the, the immediate development of the long-term care facilities will occur on the yellow portion that's hatched just because of existing servicing to those lands and constraints and further study required to uh, secure proper planning approvals onto the, um, the lands to the west in the black hatching. Currently, there are two facilities contemplated for that site in the yellow with 512 beds. Uh, and one of the one of the comments we received from our stakeholders was permissions for long-term care facilities that were flexible and consistent again across the district. And so that's reflected in the recommended official plan amendment. There's a policy that permits long-term care facilities and institutional uses across the hospital district. Next slide, please. Thank you. This is the structured parking uh, discussion. Uh, I'll just, just go briefly through the policy that's provided for, uh, or let me back up a moment. Typically in a growth area parking, we aim to, to have good urban design and good pedestrian connections. And we try and tuck the, if there's any surface parking, it's in behind buildings, uh, but we try and aim to have structured parking either above grade or below grade as a way of mitigating the impacts of surface parking. So the recommended OPA contains the best of what we're able to do in an official plan to require uh, parking. In addition to that, there's a there's a policy that would provide for a additional building height where above ground structured parking is provided. And there's some conditions that run with that policy. There is, a, or a benefit in fact, so for every additional story of parking height, there may be an additional story of building height provided to a maximum of three stories. So three stories of parking will will gain three stories of building height. And we're fronting a public road, the structured parking above ground should be lined by active uses. So that promotes a, a better interface with the, with the streetscape. And we see this as a, 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 an, an important policy for the hospital district and future growth areas. Uh, it's sort of a future proofing type of, of policy. Uh, the space that's created for parking can be converted to usable human space over time. So we realize that transit is going to be a stronger part of our future, as well perhaps car use will be going down. Uh, we're quite sure that car use will be going down and car ownership is already going down. And so that parking space can be flexible and turned into other space over time. Uh, 
We also think that above ground structured parking is less expensive to build than underground. We used to really rely on underground parking as the gold standard for it, but uh, it really does add a lot, a lot of cost to construction, which then is passed on to the purchaser of that of that floor area or that unit, however that building is is uh, being produced. And so uh, we think it's a less expensive form to build parking and leads to a more affordable product or housing product. And then finally, uh, the I think above ground parking requires less mitigation in terms of impacts to the environment underground. So the water table and pumps and those sorts of things required to make a, a, a structure function. So it's we see above ground parking as less less disruptive to those those matters. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. A couple other policies I'd like to highlight on the way through. There's um, an enhanced policy in the hospital district official plan amendment to encourage the use of district energy uh, for new facilities and to connect with, with existing facilities. And so we really, again, this is an emerging um, area of interest in our community, um, not so new emerging, but certainly it's gaining importance in our society and in our in our in our um, the world of energy consumption. And so that district energy in these sort of growth areas is a really great application for that kind of technology. And so we're trying to encourage that further here in the hospital district. As well, there is a there's a provision in here and some criteria established for site specific official plan amendments to to um, seek additional height uh, if if a particular property owner wants to move beyond the maximum of 12, uh, then they may bring in a an official plan amendment for that that additional permission and then again is uh, the our study concluded that a, a certain height of 12 max was appropriate but if an official plan amendment was brought forward to look at other permissions then that would be an acceptable process to go through next slide please so here's just a picture of uh, you may be familiar with this it hasn't changed through our study and the any refinements to the area specific plan reflect the same image it's essentially one one way that the policies would lead to the full build out of buildings in the hospital district so we call this a demonstration plan and it's it's been developed by the consultant as part of the area specific plan at full build out we expect um, at max max the hospital district could could accommodate up to 17,700 jobs and residents so that's the total jobs and residents, the total density uh, across the site. And that would break down to 11,900 jobs and 5,800 residents. When you look at how those target proportions might build out and, and the amount of gross floor area that would be associated with, with jobs and residents. Um, and speaking of gross floor area, the 100% the employment of Oakville Trafalgar is about uh, nearly uh, 300,000 meters squared GFA, and the balance of the district in employment gross floor area would be uh, 454,000 square meters, and the residential would be about 300,000 square meters. Uh, just also to underline that the full development potential of the hospital district will require uh, prioritization of transit, and we know there's some some improvements coming to the Dundas area and, and Bronny Road as well nearby. Uh, and as well, we, we have um, some strong policies and also collaboration with the region of Halton to monitor our achievement of, of the mix of uses of employment and residents or jobs and residents and, and to make sure that we're maintaining that employment focus over time for the district. Next slide, please. So just starting to wrap up the presentation here, the process and timing, uh, this is an important part for our official plan review here at the Town of Oakville. This official plan amendment 35 helps us to complete bringing the North Oakville West secondary plan into the livable Oakville official plan. That's a major goal of our town wide official plan review is to bring all of our planning documents into the livable Oakville plan. So those are the North Oakville plans. Um, we see some some great benefits of doing so uh, specifically the livable Oakville plan is more current in terms of regional and provincial plan conformity. It's a townwide and community based approach as well. Uh, so it's building on the North Oakville experience and, and bringing it into livable Oakville, which has a lot of value uh, to the community. 
also, I think the adoption of the hospital district at this time is, is critical and timely as far as providing input into the region's official plan review with a particular focus on draft ROPA 48. And I know this council has been uh, heavily engaged with that process and we've, we've had some great discussion at council about what's happening at the regional level. But draft ROPA 48, just to recall, is is uh, the first amendment of the region's official plan review that's really intended to reflect a regional urban structure was, which is based on local urban structures. And so that's our urban structure from OPA 15 and the plans and priorities established at the local level will be reflected in that ROPA. And so it's important for us to, to feed that information into the region's process. And so adopting this official plan will facilitate that. And we have some time to, to um, to do a couple of things with, with this amendment. Um, and one of them will be to provide it to the region uh, into their statutory process for draft ROPA 48. And that meeting is scheduled for June 16th, uh, just around the corner. Next slide, please. Here's another view, just a 3D rendering of that concept that we looked at earlier. Uh, again, prepared by the consultant. It's, a, it's just an illustration of how it might look. It's a view from the south looking north over the district. You can see the, the hospital there highlighted as a focal point and then uh, future build out of the, of the surrounding lands. Again, just an example. Next slide, please. So our recommendation this evening is to uh, approve the bylaw and the amendment on the basis that it's consistent with the provincial policy statement. It conforms to the applicable provincial plans and Halton's regional official plan. It has regard for matters of provincial interest and re represents good planning as set out in the report that's before you this evening. Uh, the second function of the recommendation is to repeal the 1984 official plan and to bring the hospital district into the livable Oakville plan. So that's, uh, we're saying goodbye to North Oakville West and hello to livable Oakville with that portion of the recommendation. And finally, uh, this this clause, the third clause is to, is to uh, provide notice that the decision by council reflects a full consideration of all the written and oral submissions related to this matter and that those comments have been appropriately addressed. And uh, next slide, please. This is my final slide. Thank you very much for listening and hanging in there. Um, essentially, where do we go from here? If this official plan amendment is adopted, it'll be forwarded to the region as part of their statutory process for draft ROPA 48, as I mentioned. It'll also be submitted officially to Halton Region as a package for approval. So uh, tonight is an adoption, and then the region is the approval authority for this amendment. Uh, and there's still more process. There's a possibility for modifications through that process. Uh, as well, the balance of the town's ongoing official plan review may provide for some modifications uh, through future conformity amendments as the, the landscape around the provincial framework or the regional framework is changing. So in the time we've had our, just a couple examples uh, to highlight that, in the time we've been operating our program for the official plan review, I think we've had three, three new growth plans or modified growth plans. And just recently we've been, uh, We've been uh, collaborating with the region and the province on some new land use compatibility guidelines. Uh, and I know those that may be top of mind for some of members of council. Uh, certainly the hospital district is special in the sense that it's a sensitive use area. And so any incoming type applications would be evaluated in the context of these compatibility guidelines for to, to see whether it's suitable or not. And we already use those guidelines, but there's a new set that's coming out that could be ready during this official plan review. So those, that con concludes my remarks. If there are any questions, I would be delighted to speak to them. Thank you, Mr. Bigger. Uh, you have generated some questions and you also uh, satisfied our one uh, registered delegation. So we have no delegations, uh, no one called in. And the first uh, councillor with questions is Councillor Sanju and then Councillor Elgar. Um, Councillor Sandu, we have trouble hearing you. Now? How about now? Oh, uh, it, it got a little bit better when you got closer to wherever your mic is. 
So that is my mic and my camera. So I'll get as close as I can without looking like a witch on camera or being too close to it. Um, so I, uh, I want to say thank you so much to planning staff and to uh, Mr. Bigger for putting as much effort and time as they have into this report. Uh, and thank you so much for your presentation today as well. Um, I was hoping you could talk to us a little bit about the parking reduction. You said that there is typically a, a reduction in cars that we're seeing in the area. Um, what's kind of the focus there? So if we're going to be reducing the, the, the parking, what's, what's the idea around that? So, so typically we want to build a growth area looking to the future. And so that was that future proofing comment. We want to try and minimize surface parking. We want to try and have good urban design, good connectivity for pedestrians and other other modes besides cars, good transit connections. So that's what the future of a of an intensified node looks like. In the short term, we may see some of these interim type parking uses, some surface parking that could later become a building. Uh, and then in the long term, structured parking could be underground, could be above ground as a way of freeing up more land for better better use. Uh, it could be park space, it could be more buildings, it could be boulevards, those sorts of community features that add to the, the, um, the you know, the beauty of a place. What I was getting at with, um, so essentially the parking amount or the ratio is generated through the, the development process and through a zoning, for example. That's where we would say, here's the use or here's the mix of uses and this is, the type of parking requirement for that type of development. So we'll see that as things come forward and that'll be an ongoing opportunity for council to provide input and for technical work to be undertaken to make sure the number's right. Looking beyond that, we're hoping that as, as car use declines and as other modes are made available for people to, to transport themselves or to be transported, the need for parking will decline corresponding to the decline in car use and the parking that we've built can be converted to other so you've got a building that holds cars now it's going to be a building that holds maybe a gym or something could go in there um, and then also the design of covering that parking up as it's built so that we're not looking right into a parking structure so that's kind of the thinking about parking Thank you for that. So, so that makes sense, but it leads me to another question. So you mentioned that, so obviously the reduction in cars would lead people to alternative modes of transport. So it could be biking, it could be walking, it could be actual like bus transit, it could be other transit facilities. So that's kind of where, where my, the crux of my question is. So I don't see the report or, or your presentation addressing transit in any way. And to me, in my mind, I don't know if this node works without transit. So could you give me a little bit more detail on how we would be able to manage the 60% jobs to 40% residents without transit in Ward 7? No, I totally agree. And I'm just going to, we, I think everyone acknowledges that this is a, this is a busy part of town and the roads are congested and that that may continue if we don't have uh, mitigation or other other types of modes available uh, choices for people to get around so we did have a uh, we there is a policy and i'm just i had to get out my paper for the official plan amendment there is a policy in there that we think will help to address this situation and that is to try and link development to improve transit as we go forward you can't have one stop the other but they need to be working in concert and so we've highlighted that in the policy that um, s that development is accommodated within a pl the existing and planned transportation network so we did we did try and touch on that so so i hear you but what we're seeing in front of us and what our pre-discussions were from a council perspective because we did we did talk about transit in detail in our pre-meetings um, it's not fully reflected here. And I don't think that that gives me enough comfort with just kind of like a backwards line item to something that something is very, very important to me. I think it's extremely important to our wards to have a continued transit first mentality. We can't continue to develop at the rate that we're planning to develop at without that transit in place or at least coming close to it. We don't have a done SBRT. And I realize that not all of these buildings are going to be built in a day, but we do need to be planning for it better in the future. And as this sits right now, what we're being asked to approve today, I'm not seeing it addressed. That's my concern. 
Does that make sense? No, it, it does. And again, I, I, I think it's a current a concern that's shared by the rest of council and also by staff is to have to have that orderly development supported by transit. Uh, we see Dundas changing soon, uh, mm -hmm. certainly, um, and our own local transit is, is improving to try and accommodate growth as, as it can. I mean, you made a really good comment about kind of like work moving towards a more work from home environment. And I realize that a lot of folks are taking that benefit from work when they can. Do we have any idea of the types of employment that would be in this area so that we could see whether they were actually going to be work from home types of environments? So I think that again, back to how a site specific application might come forward. We've tried to keep the whole idea of jobs and residents at a high level that links directly to the growth plan. And that through a development application process, there'd be a justification and an explanation for the mix of uses, the types of tenants or the types of residential units. We're already seeing changes in the, in the housing market to reflect a little more space for offices within a home for a work from home. So we would expect to see uh, a bit of a market response and, and uh, some justification for those types of modifications to housing or other other uses going forward to accommodate these types of new new ways of living and working. That makes sense. And then I just have one last question, Mr. Becker. So um, I know that we had spoken some time ago, I think with all of council about um, the potential of a courthouse there in that area. Do we have any indication either from the province or anywhere else whether there's going to be a courthouse there? I I am not, I don't have any information about what's happening on those lands. There may be others that could share that type of information, but it's not something that I'm I'm working on. Sorry. That's okay. Um, Thank you I, I would, that's okay. I just wanted to go back to the transportation issue as well. There was a little bit there, again, referring to the paper, um, that there there are there are some again, these aren't the best solutions. Again, public transit, mass transit will always be the gold standard that that will support growth and development of this intensity. But there are there's a there's um, an opportunity for some mitigation through transportation demand management and other types of measures that would help us with with the um, this this transition. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. I appreciate you answering my question. Thank you, Mayor Britton. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Elgar, you you have the floor. Thank you, through Mayor Burton. Uh, Kurt, thanks very much. For a great presentation. Um, one question on the, I think it's block six, which is just east of the existing hospital. Uh, there was a report, and again, it's back to the, the White Oaks radio towers. Has that all been cleared and there are no issues with building heights of 15 stories that could impact the radio frequencies and cause problems? Uh, thank you, through you, Mr. Chair, and to Councillor Elgar. I believe, Councillor, you're referring to block five from the um, yeah. okay. from the blocks. Block six is the hospital. Okay. Uh, yeah. And One. and so the zone the zoning bylaw amendment that's been approved on those lands has addressed the radio frequency matters, um, and any future development and future applications will will also be incorporating those concerns and those um, those design or mitigative type features into future development. So it's very much a part of the process to date and going forward. Uh, I mean, that, that's, this is all good news. So the people know that they can build 15 stories and, and how they will be built will to not cause a problem is all written out and will be spec'd out. That's I great. thank you for that. Thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Duddick. Thank you. Through you, Your Worship. Um, I know that you mentioned that the regional approval is the next step in the process. Kirk, do you have any indication? I dare say they've been involved, actively involved throughout this process thus far. But are you aware of any large stumbling blocks, put it that way, that may uh, be in the way of this going forward? In other words, is it just minor modifications, ones that you expect anyway? So thanks for the question, Councillor, through you, Mr. Chair. The, I, I think that the region has been deeply engaged in this process. Uh, we're talking about employment conversion at the regional plan level, and that that's um, in our work, and that's being reflected in draft Ropa 48. So there are some major 
wins, I would say, for the town and the region that are already moving forward positively. Uh, I don't anticipate major stumbling blocks, but the, you know, the province has yet to chime in and the region will be sharing our work with the province as well. And sometimes there are modifications that come from that. Uh, and then the, the region has to evaluate the hospital district in the context of the region as well. And there's a lot of moving parts there. But again, we, we have a really great working relationship and we've been having a good conversation with the region and also with council about how that's been evolving. Uh, so I, I feel positive about it. Absolutely. That's good to hear. Thanks, Kirk. Thank you, uh, Councillor Duddick. Um, councillors, with your hands up, Councillor Hazlitt Deal for the first time. Thank you, Mayor Burton. Um, further down my council colleagues' questions on transit, can you just help me a little bit with uh, some of the wording and, um, and the call out around it being a transit supported um, or a transit first? Um, I mean, there is lots to like in this report and, and some of the clarity that's come out since uh, over the multiple meetings, but I'm not seeing transit first jump out at me. And I'm wondering where do you fit that into the, this, um, this document that's going to be the guiding principles for, um, for the future? Uh, thank you, Councillor, um, for the question through you, Mr. Mayor. The, so transit first is, we could say there's already transit there. The transit has arrived on Dundas and, and in other parts. Uh, it's more about a growing transit in in sync with the development that's anticipated. So that's the that's what what Councillor Sandu was referring to earlier. Um, I think that we would be relying on related documents like the the transportation master plan and some of these other other studies that are underway to, to bring transit forward to the area in, in conjunction with the land use plan that's before you tonight. So the, the, that's the transit first, transit next piece. The other bit is the transit supportive, uh, and you've heard this through a number of development applications and discussions around height and density in the right location. This is a corridor, this is a node. We want to get the right amount of, of density in place in order to make transit viable when it is delivered there. So, um, you know, imagine running a bus through a bunch of detached homes versus running a bus in a corridor with a number of high density type developments. The number of, of transit users will, will multiply in that type of environment and help contribute to transit viability. So that's the transit supportive piece of development. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, Councillor, one second. Uh, Director Charles would like to add to uh, Planner Bigger's answer, so uh, please excuse me for interrupting you as you made to, as you tried to go ahead, uh, Mr. Charles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, sorry to interrupt the discussion. And through you, what I did want to offer is that, uh, along with with what Mr. Bigger is saying, the idea of having transit in our growth areas is critical uh, for the success of our growth areas. So the other piece to that too is that in order for us to be able to have some of these conversations with Metrolinx, we need to be able to have a firm foundation for what uh, the land use is going to look like. What is the kind of density that we're going to have in our, uh, in our growth areas? Uh, once we are able to provide that kind of a picture, it makes it easier for us to have some of those conversations with Metrolinx and be able to leverage that to deliver things such as BRT. So I just wanted to offer that uh, to the overall conversation as well. Um. Can I go ahead now? Yes, you may. Thank you for uh, your patience. No, and, and thank you for that uh, clarification. Um, I'm reminded of a phone call that I got from a human resource person at the hospital about um, how uh, a lot of the frontline healthcare workers um, were struggling with how they are going to get from point A to point B in the early stages of COVID. And, and, and my hat's off to, um, uh, our transportation group because they pivoted quickly to try and recognize um, the change in um, the schedules and how it was going to impact the healthcare workers. But I'm I'm looking at this district and, and I just I'm I am concerned that we keep talking about um, getting to um, a higher order or more uh, transit and are those threshold numbers 
um, documented somewhere because I, I think uh, Director Charles made a good point that we have to have the justification to be able to get that support. But what are those numbers? Because we have North Oakville already concerned about their um, uh, access to transit and, and uh, the frequency of transit, et cetera. Um, could, could somebody just maybe give me a little more clarity on how long before we actually have those numbers and can, can commit to say, well, when we hit this, whatever the number is, we would be better able or are able to provide that service? Well, Councillor, I have a paper by um, the former chief planning official of the province that speaks exactly to these numbers, and I'd be happy to send that to you tomorrow. So, so I'd welcome seeing it. And Mayor Burton, the reason I'm asking the question is because I think the public wants to know. I think that there are people that are in that that are in the north that are saying, so when and what is that number? But um, if, if you could share that with me, I, I would appreciate that. And thank you for your time. I'd be glad to share that with all of council. It's a, it's a very nice paper uh, full of uh, information for us and the matters presently before us. Are there any other questions? Mm -hmm. Councillor, oh, uh, excuse me. Uh, we have questions from Councillor Sandview again. And Councillor Elgar, are you, do you have your hand up again? Okay, so before we go to Councillor San Sandju, the CAO, Ms. Closey, uh, would like to speak. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, Madam CAO, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mayor Burton. I just wanted to offer to the discussion that the planning for North Oakville and the types of densities that were proposed along the urban core area along Dundas were demonstrated at that point in time and I still think is relevant are at a density um, that can support a higher order transit. Um, that is why those densities were chosen along those urban core areas um, so that we could at, at, uh, at a point in time uh, where Metrolinx was ready to deliver uh, a higher order transit, uh, we have the densities to be able to support it. And so through all the work that uh, Metrolinx has done recently with Mississauga uh, in their uh, Dundas uh, BRT plans, uh, we have also been participating in that work and providing them the, the planned densities. And now as we start to move towards some of the development that's happening, it moves us that much closer to being able to demonstrate that we have a land use, we have a density that can support a higher order transit through uh, Dundas. Thank you very much for that clarification. Councillor Sandju, you're, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor Burton. Can everyone hear me? Okay, this good. time, yes. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Madam CAO. That was actually very helpful to hear. Um, I think it just as the report sits and with the information that we've been given today, to me, this seems a bit incomplete. Um, so I appreciate the time that staff has put into this. And I realize that this is a very good package. This is a really good amount of information. And I think in council has a feels um, it's, it's, it's a good news story. Um, but I, I just can't support it. It's my ward. I don't see the level of transit and the concerns that I've raised in the past in the pre-consultations reflected here. Um, I realize I might be the only one, and that's okay. Uh, but that's kind of where I'm going to be sitting with this. So I appreciate staff's time on this. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'm not sure that uh, an official plan is where you need to look for that, but uh, but it's your privilege. Um, if there are no other questions, is there a motion? Can I have a recorded vote, Mayor Burton? Of course. But if there's no motion, there will be no vote. <laughs> Councillor Adams moves approval of the recommendation. Um, the, uh, there will be a recorded vote. In the, in the interests of uh, Zoom-like efficiency, are there any others who are opposed to the motion besides Councillor Sanju? Madam Clerk, I see none. So, Madam Clerk, would you re uh, record that uh, those present were in favor, except for Councillor Sandrew, who was against? And thank you, everybody. Can I turn you now to item 6.3, the draft plan of subdivision and zoning bylaw amendment for Argo, uh, Joshua Creek developments, part of lot eight, concession one, 1297 Dundas East. So we're going to the other side of town now. 
We have a presentation from Lee Musson, our senior planner, and there is a memo that was distributed to you earlier by about adding an additional clause to the conditions in Appendix A. And if you are watching the live stream of this meeting on oakville.ca and you wish to speak to this item, you can call 905-815-6095 and we will connect you to the meeting. You'll be called upon to speak following uh, uh, the presentation. And um, now we'll give the floor and our attention to our uh, senior planner, Lee Musson, and she will summarize for the public what you, Council, have already studied. Ms. Musson. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Burton, members of Council. My staff report can be found as item 6.3 in your agenda. The application before you was submitted by Argo Joshua Creek Development Limited for a draft plan of subdivision and a zoning bylaw amendment to, to commit the development of 609 residential units, a mixed use block, stormwater management pond, neighborhood park, Dundas Urban Core block, a village square, and actual heritage system on approximately 40 hectares of land. The purpose of this report is to provide a full staff review of the application and a recommendation on the proposed draft plan of subdivision and zoning bylaw amendment applications. A statutory public meeting was hosted by town council in August of last year. And following that meeting, the applicant expanded the draft plan of subdivision land area to include a holdout property municipally known as 1297 Dundas Street East, and as such, a new public meeting is required. Therefore, this report tonight is a combined public meeting and recommendation report. Next slide, please. The property is generally located on the north side of Dundas Street East and west of Ninth Line. The legal description of the property is part of Lot 8, Concession 1, north of Dundas Street, and 1297 Dundas Street East. The subject lands are currently located between the Bressa and Dunoak subdivisions with approximately 350 meters of frontage on Dundas Street. The southern portion of the original subdivision was separated by two holdout properties, one property located at 1297 Dundas Street and the second holdout property owned by the region of Halton. And since the statutory public meeting, the applicant has acquired 1297 Dundas Street and is in discussions with the region with regards to the balance of the regionally owned lands. The subject lands are generally flat. However, a tributary of Joshua Creek cuts through the subdivision just north of Dundas Street. The property at 1297 Dundas Street East is listed on the Oakville Heritage Register as a property of potential cultural heritage value or interest. The applicant submitted a heritage impact assessment for the property, which identifies both the barn and the house as being of cultural heritage value. Conditions of approval would require the applicant to enter into a heritage easement agreement and preparation of a conservation plan. Next slide, please. The subject lands are outlined in red on this slide. To the south is Dundas Street, beyond which are residential uses consisting of two-story detached dwellings and townhouse units. To the north and west is the Madame Phase 3 lands, which is a draft plan of subdivision currently under review. This proposal consists of detached dwellings, townhouse units, as well as a school, two parks, and a village square. To the west is the Dunno draft approved plan, which was LPAT approved in 2019. This subdivision consists of detached dwellings, townhouse units, a Dundas urban core block, school, and stormwater management pond. And then to the east is the Madame Phase 4 lands, which was draft approved in uh, 2019, and part portions, uh, sorry, this plan was uh, received draft approval in this past April, but beyond which is the Bressa subdivision, which was LPAT approved in 2019. Next slide, please. The proposal relates to the redevelopment of approximately 40 hectares of land, consisting of 609 residential units, the mixed use block, storm pond, and park, Dundas Urban Core, Village Square, and Natural Heritage System. In terms of the breakdown of the units, the applicant is proposing 208 detached dwellings, 401 townhouse units. There's a mixed, uh, a mixed use block at the located at the activity node, and there's a natural heritage system block, which accounts for approximately eight hectares of the subdivision. A stormwater management pond is located at the southern end of the subdivision. Of note is the, uh, to the west is the Dunoak subdivision, 
which contains the Holton District Elementary School site that relies on the construction of the Argo Pond for drainage purposes. With the approval of this Argo subdivision, the construction of the storm pond can commence, thereby allowing development applications to be filed for a new elementary school, which is tentatively scheduled to be open in September of 2024. The subdivision also contains 1.6 hectares of land for a neighborhood park to be combined with 2.8 hectares of land on the uh, Madame Phase 3 lands. This subdivision, if approved, would cons uh, assist in achieving a complete community in this location with the extension of roads and servicing between the Bressa, Madame 4, and the Dun Oak lands. And the proposed zoning bylaw before you this evening is required to implement this proposal. Next slide, please. The North Oak, Oakville East and West secondary plans provide a planning framework for the lands north of Dundas Street and south of 407, between Ninth Line to, in the east and Tremaine Road in the west. The North Oakville East secondary plan designates the subject property as neighborhood area, Dundas Urban Core, part of the Natural Heritage System. And the North Oakville Master Plan is intended to assist in providing guidance and coordination of local roads and adjacent land uses for the North Oakville planning area. Development applications are reviewed to ensure general co uh, coordination and consistency with the intent of the master plan. Minor modifications are permitted provided the general intent and direction of the master plan is maintained. The North Oakville master plan further identifies these lands as general urban area, suburban area, neighborhood center area, neighborhood activity node, and stormwater management facility. The proposed development is an extension of the draft plans to the east and west, and the uses are consistent with the North Oakville East Secondary Plan. Next slide, please. The subject lands are currently zoned existing development or ED as illustrated on the left side of the screen. The existing development zone only allows uses that legally existed on the date the parent bylaw came into effect. Zoning bylaw 2021-040, which is attached within Appendix B, has been prepared to rezone the lands from existing development ED to specific site-specific zones. Generally, the proposed zoning bylaw will establish modifications to the regulations pertaining to width of bay, box, and bow windows and porches, modifications to setbacks for selected lots adjacent to the natural heritage system, provides for specific regulations for the mixed-use block specifically related to permitted uses and heights, it provides specific regulations for the Dundas Urban Core Block, specifically related to permitted uses, location of uses, heights, number of dwelling units and parking and visitor parking, and establish a holding provision to ensure the sufficient servicing allocation for portions of the subdivision. However, there's one item I wanted to bring to council's attention was a request by the applicant to reduce the width of the parking space within a private garage and to allow a step to further encroach into the width of the parking space. This request was not supported by staff and is not included within the bylaw for council's consideration this evening. Next slide, please. This slide reflects the various matters identified by staff and council, and I will briefly touch on these issues, but there's a more detailed response within the staff report. Planning staff received documentation from the trustee of the North Oakville East Developers Group confirming the applicant is in good standing. The proposed development is consistent with the uses contemplated in the North Oakville East Secondary Plan and it is staff's opinion that the proposal is consistent with the provincial policy statement and conforms to the growth plan and the regional official plan. The EIRFSS was reviewed by the town, Conservation Halton, and the region and was deemed to be satisfactory. In terms of urban design policies on matters such as build form, lot size, transitions and compatibility with adjacent properties and interface with public realms and access. The applicant has submitted an urban design brief that addresses the proposals compliance with the livable by design manual. In terms of coordination and phasing of the proposed local network, a portion of the Bressa subdivision to the east was registered in November of 2020, which will provide road access to the subject lands using Wheat Boom Drive, which is Street A. A section of Street B is proposed to cross regional holdout lands, which will ultimately be conveyed to the town. Conditions of approval have been included that would allow the road and associated infrastructure, such as sewers and water mains, to be constructed on the regional lands prior to conveyance. Transportation staff have also reviewed the application and advised the proposed road and lane widths meet town standards. Next slide, please. 
In terms of on-street parking, an on-street parking analysis was provided. Under the current zoning bylaw, 817 parking spaces are required to be provided within garages and driveways. The on-street parking analysis proposes 384 parking spaces within the limits of the subdivision, providing a total of just over 1,200 parking spaces. As mentioned earlier, staff were not supportive of the applicant's request to reduce the parking space width and to allow uh, steps to encroach into the stall size. The applicant also was originally proposing to zone the mixed use block, a neighborhood center two zone, which would allow for half of the required parking to be located on the street abutting the lot. Given council's concern with on-street parking, staff did not support the applicant's request to zone the mixed use block, neighborhood center two, and the zoning bylaw before you tonight requires parking to be located on the lot on which the use is located. Next slide, please. Council also requested some clarification with respect to the village square on the Argo lands. The North Oakville East, uh, the North Oakville master plan contemplates a village square at the north end of the subdivision, which will be jointly developed with Madame Phase Three. The official plan policies require a village square to be approximately 0.3 hectares in size. The Argo portion of the village square is 0.09 hectares in size, which, when consolidated with Madame's portion of 0.31 hectares would give an overall village square of 0.4 hectares. The village square is anticipated to accommodate formal and open play areas, a shade structure, benches, and landscaping. Parks and open space staff have reviewed the council plan and have raised, not raised any issue, major concerns with the facility fit. Uh, next slide, please. An activity node is located at the intersection of streets A and B and block 282 at the southeast corner is proposed to be developed as a mixed use block. OPA 321 updated policies to enhance clarity and provide opportunities to increase the maximum height and require one mixed use or non-residential building at the neighborhood activity nodes. As part of the application, a concept plan was provided which illustrates a six story residential building with commercial uses a grade. However, the applicant's proposed zoning bylaw proposed regulations that would allow for a mixed use building or a standalone apartment building. In order to ensure the official plan policies are satisfied, proposed bylaw 2021-040 only allows for a mixed use or non-residential building at this location. Next slide, please. In terms of the transit plan and potential routes, at present, Oakville Transit provides on-demand service to North Oakville subdivisions known as Home to Hub. It is expected that this service would, will expand to include the Argo and Madame subdivisions. The on-demand service, service uses smaller capacity buses that can penetrate into subdivisions where street networks are under construction. The applicant has prepared this preliminary pedestrian circulation transit facility plan, which illustrates sidewalk locations, walkways, trail systems, bus corridors, and bus stops. Potential transit routes will be planned along any transit corridors identified in the North Oakville Secondary Plan, and these are Street A, Street B, and Street O within this subdivision. Next slide, please. Council also wanted staff to investigate the feasibility of a pedestrian connection between this subdivision and the Madame subdivision to the east. Both developments Developers have agreed to design and construct the pedestrian bridge at no cost to the town. A condition have, has been included within Appendix A to this effect. Warning clauses have also been included, advising purchasers that their property abuts or in close proximity to this bridge. Next slide, please. Council also wanted clarification with respect to the percentage of active Greek space to population and master plan agreement distribution of parkland. The North Oakville East Parks Facility Distribution Plan from 2009 is a document that is used as a guide for location, configuration, design, and development of the park system for the North, North Oakville East Secondary Plan. The North Oakville East Parks Facility Distribution Plan contemplates 10 neighborhood parks, a community park, and 30 village or urban squares based on a population target between 45 and 55,000 people. North Oakville Master Plan Agreements anticipates 64.5 hectares of parkland, which includes 11 hectare community park, 42 and a half hectares of neighborhood parks, and 11 hectares of village squares and urban squares. In terms of the distribution of parkland east of Trafalgar Road, 
our road contains a portion of neighborhood park number five, when combined with the Mattamy phase three park will be 4.4 hectares in size and as anticipated to contain two soccer fields and three tennis courts. The Mattamy phase three development, which is again currently under review, will provide neighborhood park number 10. This park is anticipated to be approximately 4.2 hectares in size and will contain two soccer fields, one basketball court and a splash pad. Neighborhood park number four was constructed by Shield Bay and is 4.3 hectares in size. And the Joshua Creek Community Park is proposed to be located on the south side of Bernathorpe Road and is anticipated to be 10 to 11 hectares in size. Uh, next slide, please. Staff recommends approval of the draft plan of subdivision subject to the conditions in Appendix A, including the new conditions circulated to Council uh, recently. Staff is also recommending zoning bylaw 2021040 be passed. Approval of, bo of both of these, of the subdivision and zoning bylaw, would assist in bringing a new elementary school online. The proposed subdivision is appropriate and compatible with the adjacent land uses and in keeping with the intent of the land use policies of the North Oakville East Secondary Plan. Staff is satisfied that the proposed development is consistent with the provincial policy statement, conforms with the growth plan, and the Halton Regional Official Plan. Issues raised by Conservation Halton and the Region of Halton have been addressed through conditions of approval. And as such, staff put forth the following recommendations for Council's consideration. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Musson. I see hands from Councillor Elgar and Councillor Adams. Councillor Elgar, why don't you go first? Thank you. To you, Mayor Burton, um, Lee, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I, I got more interesting. You talked about the parks almost sort of the whole of the north of Oakville, correct? What there's going to be? I was mainly uh, looking at the east of Trafalgar Road. Okay. Lee, when you're covering that, one thing jumped out. What about a high school? Any idea where we might put a high school north of Dundas someday? Like it? Uh, the, the, uh, okay, so the Dunlop plan has a Halton District Elementary School. The Mattamy Phase 3 plan has the Halton Catholic Elementary School. Uh, I'm not sure where the high school has been located, is deemed to be constructed. I believe it may be west side of Trafalgar Road. But it's, it's none, of, none of them, there's no high school in this particular area. Okay, I wonder whether we maybe, I, I realize not of this application, but we could maybe get a staff report back sometime on where we might get a high school, because it was supposed to be one near Nyagawa, and some, somehow it seems to have gone up in smoke. But the, the, I think it was like, it was like almost 700 children which were going to high school in, in north of Dundas, and with all the development going there, it, it's going to be an astronomical number of high school students. So I, I, I just hope we can soon get a location for the Ward, ward 7. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Adams. Thank you very much. Um, I just had a, a couple of things to say. I, I assume that there's no uh, members of the public who wish to delegate tonight. Uh, is that correct? Uh, That's sure? correct, Councillor. Okay, then, um, first of all, I, I want to thank Lee uh, Musson for her work on this file. Uh, she spent uh, a lot of time on it, and there's a whole bunch of improvements that have happened um, as a result of her work on the file. So, I, first of all, I want to thank Lee for, for that. I know uh, there's a number of people on staff who have been involved in it, but certainly Councillor Lischina and I have uh, been working with Lee on a number of these issues, and so we, we do appreciate your work on the file. Um, I also know that there are there are some people out in the the world who um, don't don't appreciate the uh, length of time that um, has gone on in terms of the development proposals and, and process for uh, bringing forward these development designs. Um, and there are some who uh, would would like to see that there be no development uh, in these areas, particularly, for example, on these lands and other lands in the area. Um, and unfortunately, we're we're well past that point. The, in terms of the development um, timing and how things get urbanized. Uh, the lands, of course, were designated to be urbanized by the region way back in the 90s. Uh, and we've come through a whole bunch of master planning process. We went through what some of us call the seven year war in terms of um, uh, developing the master plan for the area and the secondary plans. Uh, and so, you know, unfortunately, we're not in a position where we can just say, no, we can't have any more development. Uh, on these lands. And so in terms of that, 
uh, the, the plan of subdivision and the zoning bylaw amendment is, um, I think, appropriate given the, uh, the higher levels of planning that have happened already. Uh, the, some of the changes that we've made on this particular plan, including the uh, pedestrian bridge crossing, I think is a great improvement. Uh, and there's a number of other changes that have happened through the process as well. Uh, I just wanted to read the, uh, the extra memo, um, the extra condition that we would like to add in, and that's that the owner uh, and or their engineering consultants shall arrange and hold a pre-construction meeting with development engineering and the contractor to review and discuss mitigation measures for all construction related impacts related uh, including mud tracking, dust suppression, truck routes and contractor trading, uh, trades parking, material storage, noise mitigation, et cetera, prior to the commencement of any works. Uh, these are things that would normally be uh, checked on and, and worked with uh, on, uh, by our staff and the, uh, the applicants, uh, but we wanted to make sure that the, these particular issues were highlighted uh, so that the applicant was aware that there are concerns and issues that uh, are arising as these developments are coming forward. Uh, and that we're going to take them seriously, they're important, and they need to be dealt with. Um, so our staff will have our backing as we uh, proceed forward in terms of dealing with these issues. Uh, so with that, Your Worship, I'd be uh, willing to move the recommendation of our staff, including that uh, additional condition. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor hazlitt uh would like a word. I just had one question, Mayor Burton, and that is around the warning clause. It says, um, I understand there's a mixed use or non-residential building, um, but it then goes on to talk about the height at six stories. Sometimes the bonusing, it gets confusing. Is, is that inclusive of any bonusing or is there bonusing allowed on top of that six stories just for clarity? Your worship to the councillor. So this is the mixed use block she's referring to in the activity note. There isn't bonusing anticipated on this block. The minimum height is four stories, maximum height is six. Thank you for clarifying that, Lee. All right. Uh, the item is properly moved. Um, and unless there's a hand, I will put the vote. Any objection? Madam Clerk, there being no objection, that carries. Um, Thank you, Council. Um, I would invite your attention to the advisory committee minutes, and uh, which is the next item in our agenda. And the recommendation is that uh, uh, the following recommendation pertaining to item 4.1 of the Heritage Oakville Advisory Committee minutes from its meeting on May 18th be approved and the remainder of the minutes be received. And uh, I'm looking to see if Councillor Duddick is the one who's moving this, or Councillor, oh, Councillor Giddings, you'll have to arm wrestle. Councillor Giddings, uh, I'll recognize you as the mover. Is there any objection? Uh, there being none, Madam Clerk, that too is carried. Uh, it's time to seek a motion to rise and report to Council. Councillor has the deal, thank you for that. Any objection? There being none, that carries. I rise and report the Committee of the Whole has met and has made recommendations on consent items 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, public hearing items uh, uh, 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, and advisory committee minutes item 9.1, as noted by the clerk. A mover and seconder for the report would be in order. Councillor Longo, Councillor Chisholm, thank you. Any objection? Madam Clerk, there being no objection, um, is there any new business that anyone has to bring before us? I'll give you a bit. The Habs are up one nothing in the game. So you Hab fans can be uh, happier than you might have been otherwise. And now you've got to hope that the team can hold that lead. Uh, would two of you like to give us a motion and a second for the consideration and reading of the bylaws? Councillor Elgar and Councillor Robertson, thank you. Uh, this is, uh, uh, any objection? There being none, Madam Clerk, uh, the bylaws are approved. Thank you very much, everybody, for your time and attention. Those of you addicted to the Habs have time to enjoy the rest of the game. And uh, it's been terrific working with you. And uh, that is the end of the meeting.